Good morning. I'm Mary Mason, and I'm the president of the Friends of Old Dover. The Friends of Old Dover and the Division of Historical Cultural Affairs are pleased to present a program on Richard Bassett, one of Delaware's most prominent figures during the American Revolution and our early years as a free and independent nation. The Friends of Old Dover, also known as the Historical Society of Dover, takes pride in the preservation of our colonial history, architecture, and historical properties. Through education, historical theater, festivals, and exhibits, we keep our city alive with the past along with the present. The Friends of Old Dover would not have existed without Mabel Ridgely. In 1933, starting the Storied Houses and Gardens of Old Dover. Over the years, it grew into Dover Days, and in 1950, the Friends of Old Dover took over the event, and our historical society was born. Today, we partner with HCA and First State and Heritage Park to continue our quest to keep the history of our state capital alive. For more information on the Friends of Old Dover, you can visit us on Facebook or the internet by entering Friends of Old Dover, or visit the Delaware shops at 325 South State Street. Thank you. We are so pleased to again, for the third time in the past two years, collaborating with the leadership of the Old State House to offer a program of historic significance to the Dover public and beyond. In November 2020, the program was Colonel John Haslam, commander of the Delaware Continental Regiment during the first year of the Revolutionary War. A year ago, in February 2021, we collaborated to bring you Remembering Washington with George Washington, with Tom Welsh as Alan McLean, telling about his relationship with and admiration for his commander, General George Washington. This year, the topic is Richard Bassett, a quiet patriot. Tom has been researching Richard Bassett since the pandemic began and has put together today a program based on that research. Since 2007, Tom has been a historical interpreter at the Old State House and takes great pleasure in being able to delve into the lives and careers of George Washington, Alan McLean, John Hazlitt, and bring that research to you, interested historians. Now let us prepare to hear about Richard Bassett, the Quiet Patriot. If I would ask each one of you what Delawarean served in all three branches of government, senator, representative, judge, and governor, plus being our first elected U.S. senator, and also a federal judge, would any of you know who that person was? I think that very few, if any, would have guessed Richard Bassett. There was another dozen or so roles that he also held, which I'll be hearing about in the next few minutes. He was a very busy man, and I hope to tell you his story today. For being one of the most active early founding fathers of both Delaware and our nation, Richard Bassett was one of the patriots who seemingly was one of the least vocal, and as a result, is one of the least known of our early fathers. Caesar Rodney, Thomas McCain, George Reed, Gunny Bedford Jr., John Hazlitt, John Dickinson, and several others gave impassioned speeches and wrote and communicated their views by letter and other writings. In one of Bassett's most important roles, that being delegate to the Constitutional Convention in Philadelphia, historians point out that he rarely spoke out and virtually none of his views were recorded other than his votes, of course. One delegate described him as a man of plain sense, with modesty enough to know to hold his tongue. In his family life, Richard was born in 1745 at Bohemia Manor in Cecil County, Maryland, an enormous estate bounded by the Bohemia and Elk Rivers, the Back Creek, 
in the Delaware border. Augustus Herman, in the year 1669, received a 6,000 acre land grant and became the founder of Bohemia Manor, and it was enlarged over time by several acquisitions. When Richard's father deserted mother and son, Richard was adopted by Peter Lawson, who was a kinsman and an attorney, under whom he did some of his law studies. It was from Lawson that Bassett later inherited Bohemia Manor, the primary source of his wealth throughout his life. Most likely, Richard was married three times. His first wife, whom he married in 1774, Christmas week actually, was Ann Ennals, E-N-N-A-L-L-S, of Dorchester, Dorchester County, Maryland, who died, she died in 1796. He had one surviving child, Ann. We'll hear a more about her in a moment. In 1796, he married Betsy Garn Garnett, and they and from Talbot County, Maryland, and they moved to Dover. It was then that he leased out Bohemia Manor. There was some mention of a third wife, last name Bruff, but I found very little to corroborate. Some historians point out he was married twice. Uh, two or three mentioned Miss Bruff, but very little else. It might be a research project for some of you out there to chase down the Bruff family. He raised but one daughter, Anne, who married the Honorable James A. Bible, who became a very prominent and, you might say, even famous Delaware. Byron studied law with Bassett, and as a colleague pointed out, also a lawyer named Ingersoll. And Bassett and Byron became great friends and associates and also friendly rivals, which is captured a bit in this account. On occasion, Bassett would cut his son-in-law down by saying, all you know I taught you, and would be answered, you taught me all you knew, and all I know besides, I taught myself. He also had one adopted daughter, Rachel McCleary, his sister's child, who married Joshua Clayton, who was a friend of Richard, also from Bohemia Manor. Both sons, both sons-in-law, had marvelous productive political careers and were part of family dynasties that had been very visible in Delaware throughout our state's history. Like many of the colonists, especially those whose roots were in England, Bassett was loyal to the British government. And this did get him in a bit of trouble on more than one occasion. And it took a longer time for him to come around to adopt the position of supporting independence from the crown. This contrasts with the fact that many from Ireland and Scotland, whose families had been so mistreated by the English, who were either against the crown before the struggle for independence, or easily persuaded to take up arms against the British. Thomas McCain, John Hazlitt, and Alan McLean were examples of those who did not need such a period of transition. They came to the fray already against the king. I have, I have been unable to locate specific events that brought about his transition from loyalist to dedicated patriot, but clearly the change was complete based on his active support of the American cause throughout the war. Delaware Justice, modern time Maurice Mo Hartnett, whom some of us know or knew, in a 1987 article entitled Richard Bassett, Patriot or Tory. In that, Judge Hartnett addresses the question, laying out both sides of the issue, an article well worth your reading. And clearly, if you read between the lines, he would say, no way was Bassett a Tory. His transition was further complicated by his conversion to the Methodist faith. The founder of Methodism, John Wesley, was a priest in the Anglican Church in England. And he also held views of pacifism, 
not unlike the society of France. Wesley did not want the colonists to become independent of the English crown. He did not want the Methodist societies to become independent of the Anglican Church, and he instructed his early missionaries who came to America from England not to support the cause of liberty and independence. Francis Asbury, who came to America about 18, 1772 at the behest of Wesley, became the dominant force expanding Methodism by writing all over the colonies. It's projected that he probably wrote 300,000 miles, gave 65,000 sermons, and ordained in the field, without seminary training, about 6,000 Methodist clergy. The reason I've given this background of Asbury is that Asbury became a very dominant force and a very important influence in Bassett's life. Bassett, on a trip to visit his friend Judge Thomas White down near Whitesburg in uh, southwest Kent County, met Asbury and was so moved by his spiritual depth that he shortly became one of the strongest and certainly one of the most prestigious supporters of the Methodist faith. The fact that Wesley, Asbury, and the other Methodist clergy held the views of pacifism and continuing support for the British government caused Bassett and all the Methodists to be suspect and identified as Tory or loyalist. Meeting and becoming a lifelong friend of Francis Asbury was a very life-changing occurrence for Bassett. He was moved and troubled by the purity of spirit and, dedicated, and dedication to God that Asbury embodied. This led him to seriously reevaluate his life and become concerned that the sin in his life, very, very uh, consumed with the sin in his life, could only be erased and forgiven through what might be referred to as Bassett's conversion. Specifically, he felt that he could no longer be an owner of slaves and freed his slaves. Not only that, he became an ardent abolitionist and other methods such as Alan McLean and Judge Thomas White joined him in that cause. He financially supported the Methodist causes, including the building of churches and campaigning sites. Uh, he gave money for the building of Wesley, the first Wesley church right here in Dover which just happens to be my church. He even constructed a camp meeting ground at Bohemia Manor. He is described as one of the most dedicated Methodist laymen on the Denmark Peninsula. And for those who don't know what a camp meeting is, it was what in the modern times might be called a revival. They would meet, stay in uh, tents or thrown together shacks for a week and sing and praise as many as several thousand people and he even built a, uh, as I just said, he built a camp meeting ground right on Bohemian Manor and sponsored those for thousands of people. For those who have read the plaque down in Rehoboth, it says that in 1870, those Methodists created a camp meeting site at a place using the biblical name called Rehoboth. Some people know that. Many people are quite shocked to hear that Rehoboth started out as a camp meeting ground. The story of the story of Black Monday in 1776 was a stain on his reputation throughout. His early support of the loyalists led to his involvement in a confrontation known as Black Monday, which was a either a plot to raid and burn Dover, or it was an alleged plot to raid and burn Dover. And a man who became a lifelong thorn in his side by the name of Thomas Rodney took the view that they were going to raid and burn Dover. And he was in his bed and was uh, Bassett was in his bed and his home was broken into and they arrested him for being part of this a 
alleged planned rape. We don't know too much about what happened, but he, uh, he was exonerated, released, and uh, into that story, except it comes back to haunt him much later when he ran for governor. There was a negotiation that led to his release, but clearly there was a stain on his reputation throughout his life. He never completely erased that blemish. Bassett had friends who were avowed and open loyalists, as did everyone in that day. It was not surprising that your neighbor, a farmer or a colleague or a co-worker, was of the opposite thought. One of his friends, Judge Thomas White, was also an active Methodist, but he was a very avowed and open loyalist throughout his life. Once, Judge Thomas was being chased across the green by the likes of Thomas Rodney. I don't know if Rodney was part of it that day, but he was being chased, and uh, Bassett went out and saved him and took him into his home. That was all that the, uh, what are called the Whigs, or the Patriots, the side of the argument represented by Thomas Rodney. That's all they needed to confirm in their minds that Bassett certainly was a loyalist. I've been unable so far to locate any writings by Bassett stating his position relative to support of the loyalist position. Might be thought of as the Tory position of those seeking independence, the Whig position. He was described as a conservative throughout his life but nonetheless supported the creation of a new and independent government of the former colonies. He became one of the most prominent Federalists throughout his life. And through about 1827, uh, the Federalists dominated uh, elections in both U.S. Senate and governorship um, much later than any other state. Uh, one of his first public appearances was as a member of the Boston Relief Committee. This was a committee to assist and be supportive of the people of Massachusetts who were the earliest supporters of the split from England. He continued his support of the cause of liberal justice as a member of the Delaware Council on Safety, resulting from the Continental Congress's urging all the colonies to begin monitoring the growing dispute with the British. He also served as a member of the Committee on Communication. It's got a bigger name, but I couldn't find it when I was finishing this, my notes up last night. So I'm calling it the Committee on Communication. His involvement in these three committees in support of independence certainly does not appear to be that of a Tory. To demonstrate how broad his involvement was in Delaware government, we're going to take you on a little tour representing the locations where he served. Richard Bassett served in the General Assembly for a period of 10 years, from 1776 to 1786, but in terms of full disclosure, he never served in this building. We're in what was called the House of Assembly, the William Penn name, and we continued that in our first Constitution from 1776, but it was only in 1792 when these very men established that there would be a constitutional convention which led to our second constitution 
and that one, the name of the, in the second constitution, the name of the lower house was changed from House of Assembly to House of Representatives. I said he served 10 years. Of those 10 years that he served in the General Assembly, seven were in this upper house called Legislative Council. We'll be over there in a minute, talk a few minutes about that. Uh, he served three in the House of Assembly. And as I said, he did not serve in this building. He served in the Golden Fleece Tavern. Well, initially for one year, he was in the uh, Senate that met in Newcastle. And then after the Battle of Brandywine, the government moved here. And so then he met in the House or, or the Senate for the next nine years at either the Golden Fleece Tavern, where the Senate met, or the George Washington Tavern, where the House of Representatives met. During his service in the House, Bassett introduced, in keeping with his Methodist view against slavery, he introduced legislation to prevent the exportation of slaves as being contrary to the principles of humanity and justice and derogatory to the honor of the state. A bill did pass which prevented the sale of slaves to the Carolinas and Jamaica. The legislation provided that healthy slaves, under that legislation, over 18 and under 35 were hereafter to be free without security or a bond. Many men slaves and their descendants were permitted to hold property and to obtain redress in law and equity for any injury. By 1797, the prohibition on sale of slaves was expanded to exclude any sale being sold out of state, no matter what the location. Clearly, the influence of Quakers and Methodists, such as Bassett, was key to the progress made in Delaware in the lives of enslaved persons. Now we will go to the upper house, across the hall. We're now standing in what became the Senate in 1792 under Delaware's second constitution. Uh, it might be pointed out, since I'm mentioning that, that Richard Bassett was on the Constitutional Convention for the first Delaware Constitution in 1776, and then he was in the second one for the 1792 uh, Constitution. The 1792 Constitution was generated by one of the primary acts that was done by the House and the Senate in 1791, the first year that the legislature met here in 1791. And they established that there would be a new constitution. And uh, the primary reason for the new constitution was to be sure the state had the taxing authority that they needed. But while that constitutional convention was meeting, they did several other things. Delaware was one of the first states in that second constitution to drop the requirement that voters be large landholders. Uh, so that was a, a first, Delaware was either the first or one of the first few states to do that. Uh, we're now going to move back down stairs to the courtroom. Repeating myself, this is the courtroom, one of the Five, one of the four places where he served uh, in this building or its predecessor. This is the courthouse that was built in 1791, uh, built 1786 to 1791, opened in 1792. And the courtroom here was used from 1792 to 1873 with the courtroom over here on the southeast corner of the Green and State Street was built. The first footprint of the state government here was a little courthouse that William Penn had directed to be built, and it was built in 1722. It was torn down in 1786 to make room for this. 
So it was going to be a courtroom, a courthouse only. The state meeting in the Golden Fleece Tavern and the George Washington Tavern sent a delegation over and they negotiated joint use. And the county said, but we want the first floor for the courtroom and the other county offices. You can have the second floor where we've already been. This is, of the four places in this that we're visiting today, this is the only one that Richard Bassett actually served in. He was first the judge in the Common Pleas Court, and then he was elevated and became the Chief Justice of the Common Pleas Court. So this is a place that he actually served. He resigned from Chief Justice when he became governor in 1799. And that's where we're going to move next to the governor's office to hear about that election of 1798. In 1798, Richard Bassett defeated David Hall for governor. While we may think that dirty tricks and vitriolic political campaigns are a modern feature, it should be known that the campaign of 1798 was anything but friendly. Because of Bassett's friendship with known loyalists and his membership and strong support of the Methodist Church, which many people thought was a Tory enterprise, ten years after the war, he was still facing animosity and suspicion from the Democratic Party. Thomas Rodney and others whipped up a furor by labeling him a Tory. To counter that accusation, some of the Federalist supported, supporters created a counter campaign to present him as a true patriot. His good friend, Alan McLean, secured a statement from George Washington extolling Bassett's contribution to the cause of freedom and independence. Bassett won the election by a wide margin. One of the pieces of evidence that Bassett was a loyalist was his support of the Kent County Resolution to support the King even while the committee was adopting all the resolutions resisting the series of acts that the colonists found so objectionable. Ironically, it should be noticed that Thomas Rodney was also on that same committee supporting the resolution that Del Branch should continue to be loyal to the king. Remember that throughout the war, never were the patriots in a majority. The population was divided almost evenly into three equal parts. One-third loyalists, one-third patriots, and one-third uncommitted folks waiting to see which way the wind was blowing. While governor, one of the proposals that Bassett made was a change in the penal code to provide for more humane treatment of convicts rather than the existing practices of branding mutilation, and whipping. Unfortunately, those proposals were not enacted. This is the site of the Golden Fleece Tavern, where Richard Bassett was elected to be one of our delegates to the ratification convention. Golden Police Tavern is important because it represents the third election of Richard Bassett to a position relating to the United States Constitution. In the first case, he was elected as one of five Delawareans to go to Annapolis for a convention which was intended to strengthen the Articles of Confederation. There being insufficient quorum to do anything, uh, they uh, at least at the stage for a convention one year later, which we now know as the U.S. Constitutional Convention. So, yes, Bassett, Bassett was elected to that, along with the same four people who went to Annapolis, who were elected to go to Annapolis, George Reed, John Dickinson, Gunny Bedford, Jr., and Jacob Broome. And uh, at the Constitutional Convention in Philadelphia, they all five voted yes to the Constitution, uh, and it passed and was fully drafted 
ready to be dealt with by the states by September 17, 1787, which we celebrate as Constitution Day. After the U.S. Constitution was completed and approved in Philadelphia, according to Article 6, it had to be ratified by nine of the 13 states. Each state had the prerogative to design that state's method of completing the ratification process. The Delaware plan was to have 10 men elected from each of our three counties, and for those 30 delegates to come to Dover to meet at the Golden Fleece Tavern on December the 2nd. And after four days, they had ratified, approved it, and were ready to sign it. So it got signed on December 7th, which we now know as as <clears throat> we now know that as Delaware's nickname, the first state. And you all know that, or at least we can tell you, that when people come from out of state, from other states all across the nation, a very high percent of them know that's our nickname. At the very first election for the new nation in 1788, Richard Bassett and George Reed were elected as Delaware's first two U.S. Senators to represent Delaware in the Congress. As a U.S. Senator, Bassett called to the attention of the Delaware General Assembly that Maryland and Pennsylvania had passed legislation to consider building a canal from the Chesapeake to the Delaware. And he was concerned about that, did not want Delaware to be left out. So he called the uh, General Assembly together to consider that. In the final days of his presidency, President John Adams appointed Bassett as a federal district judge, a position he held for a year, 1801 to 1802, until the Democrats, under Thomas Jefferson, eliminated that position. His record of service also includes the fact that he was a member of the first Delaware Constitutional Convention in 17, or the first Delaware Constitutional Convention in 1776, and the second Delaware Constitutional Convention in 1792. His military service consisted of being a member of the Delaware Militia and being selected as a captain of the Light Horse Cavalry. He was cited as being that from 1777 to 1781, but it was only really active in the first year of 1777. He also served as the presidential elector in the election of 1796 and cast his vote for fellow Federalist John Adams. Other organizations which he supported were, maybe not of interest to everybody, but the Delaware Bible Society, the Abolitionist Society, and many other charitable and social improvement groups across the region. Regarding his lifetime career in government, my summary statement is, Richard Bassett did everything. I would like to close by encouraging all of you in the audience to consider spending some time to first find a historical character such as Richard Bassett or a historical event and do your own personal research. As I have been gathering information about how much the folks of Delaware know about Richard Bassett, the summary of my questioning folks is that people know very little. The, there are also the resources that we have in the state, beginning with the Delaware Public Archives, the Delaware Historical Society, the Delaware Military Museum, which is southwest of Wilmington, which, which most people don't know, and Barrett's Chapel and Museum, which is a loaded source for all things Methodist. I am so pleased to have brought you the story of this Richard Bassett, a quiet patron.